Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Many of you have been here throughout the series and you know that over the last month we've addressed important contemporary issues. Reconciliation and climate change came up regularly, but so did a host of other important issues of the day, everything from the wars that Australia has been engaged with, our capacity as a race to exterminate ourselves in a moment, uh, to gay marriage. But we've also asked some of the deeper philosophical questions around the morality and the conceptualisation of politics. Tonight, we come together, we pull it together as a single panel. I'm Tony Jones for these purposes, uh, and you're the Q&A audience, and if we could not have inane tweets during the time, we'd all, I'm sure, be very grateful for that. I'm going to kick off today by briefly introducing our speakers. Most of you know them already, uh, so I'll just be very brief about that, and I will give an entirely superficial overview of what they said for those of you who either weren't here or might not remember. Now, these are some very complicated, sophisticated, elegantly expressed ideas. Uh, please do go and watch them online from our web page if you find the sort of two sentences that I'll manage uh, insufficient. We begin with our host, Professor Raymond Gator, who spoke about political dignity. Professor Gator is a professorial fellow in law and arts, also supported by the Vice-Chancellor here at the University of Melbourne, and an Emeritus Professor of Moral Philosophy at King's College London. His works on philosophy have engaged with some of the most important issues of the time, of truth, of justice, of good and evil, and he of course brought many of those ideas into his talk. His lecture suggested the estrangement from talk of political dignity goes together with an estrangement from a robust conception of citizenship. He went on to try and explain why he believes that there's not enough morality, a word actually we don't hear very often anymore, which ties in with some of the themes of his lecture in contemporary politics. He posed a challenging question of whether we are disillusioned with our politics and politicians for not adhering to standards of political morality or whether we become disillusioned because we really don't know what standards of political morality are anymore. Our next speaker, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight, was Professor Larissa Berendt from the Njambana Indigenous House of Learning at the University of Technology in Sydney. She challenged whether the energy that's put into the concept of reconciliation in all its various symbolic forms has led to some degree of cynicism, particularly in the Indigenous community, about a lack of similar commitment to practical outcomes for Indigenous Australians. So while not saying the symbolic was unimportant, she said if we had to engage in the politics of reconciliation, it needed to go further than that. 20 years after Mabo, 40 years after the tent embassy, where are we on reconciliation, she asked, and why has it taken so long to close the gap? Professor Gary Simpson spoke next. Gary is the Kenneth Bailey Professor of Law at Melbourne Law School, having previously held positions at the London School of Economics and ANU. He writes on international law and theory in all of its many manifestations. His lecture revolved around conceptions of political literacy and political literateness, the former encompassing an idea of technical nous in matters of political grammar and practice, and we see many practitioners of that sort of, uh, of political literacy, but the latter a way of thinking, perhaps more deeply, about politics, uh, and he then connected this uh, also to politics and the ideas of politics that came through literature. I rather enjoyed this observation, though it had a somewhat chilling edge. Hating politics or not being interested in politics is bovine and irresponsible. And anyway, politics is interested in us. And the worse things get, the more interested it becomes. Finally, Robert Mann spoke on whatever happened to argument. Professor Robert Mann is a personal chair in politics and convener of the Ideas and Society program at the Trobe University and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. He's written about a whole range of important politically significant issues, both in Australia and those with international impact. Now, his lecture took the lens of climate change to challenge the Enlightenment assumption that in the long run, reason would triumph over ignorance. Speaking of his own role as a public intellectual, a role he, he expressed some discomfort about, and the various issues that he's discussed in the past, he said, in every instance I've hoped to be able to convince fellow citizens of something of significance through argument, where reason, evidence, and perhaps above all, judgment are involved, much the point of this series as well. 
I have come to feel, however, as never before in a life of involvement in public controversy, the futility of argument. This lecture, he said, was an attempt to show why. In describing his first lecture, Ray said that though we may have many reasons to be disillusioned with politics, we must not lose sight of the ideals that inform that disillusionment and which alone can prevent it from degenerating into cynicism. I wonder if our other panellists agree. Each of them is now going to speak for somewhere between five and ten minutes, coming back to some of the themes of their own lectures and joining them up with the other lectures through the series, and then we're going to open it up for brief comments, questions and discussion. Let us start with our host, Professor Raymond Gator. Uh, well, thank you very much, Caroline, and uh, uh, thank you also as Dean of the Law School for making this possible, and also to Glyn Davis, who's made these lectures possible. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Gary, too, who's helped me along with this quite a lot. Uh, and I'm going to thank in advance uh, Di and Joanna for running up and down with the microphones, <laughs> uh, which they will do. Uh, well, I'm... Um, Oh, I also, I've been asked to, to, say, that the, uh, to, to the, say that these uh, lectures have all been recorded uh, and uh, for details on how to access them, go to the Melbourne Law School uh, news and events pages and you'll be directed from there. Well, I'm not uh, good at coming up with titles, but I was uh, quite pleased with uh, whatever happened to politics, though I was a little worried that it might encourage people to think that the series would be a lament about the poor quality of politicians uh, or that uh, lament about the fact that we appear no longer to have leaders of vision. Uh, but it didn't, uh, I, I didn't want that and it didn't go that way. And I was indeed glad to hear Gary Simpson say that disliking politicians and politics was generally politically reactionary. And in the next uh, few minutes, I want to, uh, to restate what uh, some of the main points of my lectures and to relate them to some of the other ones. I began by noting that many people would say that the phrase, the dignity of politics, is an oxymoron and ditto for the morality of politics. And though they'd say it with a smile, it would be, I think, an awkward one. We're not sure, I think, whether we believe that politics can have dignity but doesn't now have it and probably won't have it in the foreseeable future, uh, or whether we believe that the, con the very concept of dignity has at best an attenuated application to politics. We don't know whether we're disillusioned with our politicians while having a firm hold on the standards that inform our disillusionment or whether we're losing our grip on the concepts that make those standards what they are, whether we're disillusioned about the prospects for justice, for example, or whether we're coming to think that the very idea of justice as a distinctive kind of limit uh, and therefore the judge of power uh, was always an illusion. Well, the distinction I made between people losing confidence in their beliefs and losing a grip on the concepts that give content to those beliefs is sometimes hard to elaborate, but if we don't make it, I think, we'll continue to misunderstand the nature of our discontent. And in my lecture, I argued that we have an increasingly fragile hold on the concepts in which the idea of political dignity finds its home, or to put it uh, another way, and I think a better way because it expresses the deep connections between language and thought, between what we can think and what we can say, I'd put it this way, that the words and phrases that enable us to retain full possession of and to use creatively the family of concepts in which that of political dignity has its home have an insecure place uh, in our life with language. And some of those words are vocation rather than career, honour, character, names of the virtues, governing insofar as we distinguish that from merely running the country, and of course citizenship. Max Weber called his classical essay on political responsibility, politics as a vocation, and I remarked that he could have called it political dignity. The two are closely related, and if you lose one, you lose the other. The concept of vocation is interesting, I think, because when one thinks of what one does under that concept, when one thinks, for example, of what it means to be a nurse or a teacher or a politician, one is called upon to think in a way that can deepen without limit, 
And that's not true of questions like what is the purpose of this or that activity or institution, or what do we really want from this activity or institution. The answer to the latter questions might sometimes be complex, but they can generally be settled by a good committee of inquiry, provided it's given the right kind of data. Reflection on what it really means to have this or that vocation, however, does not simply discover our real desires and interests. It can awaken desires we never had in response to values we had never before encountered. And it's thought, this thought about vocation whose historical depth can secure for the concept of this or that vocation a sufficient distance from time and place to enable us to judge whether, rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter for my point, to judge that our desires or our purposes or our aspirations and even the spirit of the times were faithful or faithless to the vocation in question. And insofar as we think at all about politics as a vocation, and we hardly do anymore, we think of it as a career, our thoughts turn to politicians. But citizenship, too, is a vocation, I think. Or at any rate, the question, what does it mean to be a citizen, can be one that invites the same kind of reflection I just sketched, enabling the kind of distance from time and place that protects one a little, at least, against the pressures of the moment or the immediate future. And on this and on other matters, Gary Simpson and I were in agreement, I think. As a working definition of political literacy, Gary offered this, a combined attention to language and to history. In my lecture, I gave uh, two uh, examples to illustrate the point I wanted to make about citizenship. And the first focused in the, on the 1980s when the Victorian government proposed to place some of its prisons in private ownership. The debate then was primarily over whether such prisons would be efficiently managed. And that was one of the earlier expressions of the idea which is now ubiquitous, that politics is basically running or managing institutions to serve our interests. But its applications to prisons should, I said, have raised a red flag on which was written this question. Is it consistent with any serious conception of what it means to be a citizen that one should hand one's fellow citizens over to private profit-making organizations for their punishment? I don't say the answer is obvious, but we should have felt the pressure of the question, and that we didn't, I think, was a measure of the decline in our consciousness of the concept of citizenship. My second example uh, was about the intervention, and in, in anticipation, although perhaps slight disagreement with Larissa uh, Berend, uh, I commented on the, the decline uh, of the concept of reconciliation, a decline which came under the pressure of a largely false distinction between so-called merely symbolic reconciliation and practical reconciliation. And I think that distinction, or the way it was used, enabled the intervention in the Northern Territory uh, to be conducted in a spirit that was an insult to the dignity of the indigenous peoples as human beings and to the dignity of them as citizens. I come now briefly uh, to Rob's lecture. I know that this is not what he particularly wanted to emphasize, but it struck me listening to him that what was most frightening about the success of climate change denialism was not only that the denialists were so successful in convincing people to believe that climate change was not a serious threat, but also, and perhaps more seriously, that they were eroding the concept of sober judgment itself. What, after all, does it say about the standards of what political philosophers sometimes call public reason that someone like Alan Jones could say, as he did the other day, the talk of man-made climate change is witchcraft. What is at least as frightening as what people believe in this connection is the erosion of the conditions for the formation of reasonable, reasonable belief. Denialists call it skepticism, but in the kind of cases that Rob called denialism distinguishing distinguishing them from scepticism and what he called contrarianism, it's really not scepticism, it's gullibility, 
which is an affliction to which scepticism is liable when it's not anchored to the conditions of sober judgment. And as I spoke about, as Rob spoke about this, I recalled Hannah Arendt's discussion of the prevalence in the Weimar Republic uh, of gullibility. Gary remarked that the imminent danger of nuclear catastrophe and the only slightly more distant threat of climate change catastrophe could make the other concerns of politics and even politics itself look small and ephemeral. Hannah Arendt wrote movingly of political responsibility as being the expression of a love of the world and she meant primarily the human world. When the overriding concern is not with humanity in that ethically inflected sense that the word has when we speak of a common humanity or of a person losing his or her humanity or of people being dehumanized, when it's not a concern with humanity in that sense and no longer a concern with citizens but with the species, homo sapiens, and not with the world but with a planet, then I fear that we may be in danger of developing not a new politics appropriate to the circumstances, but indeed an anti-politics. Now that, I'll stop. So um, I think, in a way, uh, there were two sets of questions being posed in these lectures. And this is partly about the relationship between uh, my lecture and Rob's lecture the week after. Uh, and these questions map onto two different sorts of politics. One I'll call uh, classical politics, and the other I'll call catastrophic politics. So first of all, classical politics. So the first set of questions might have felt familiar to um, Plato, uh, Weber, or Machiavelli. These were questions about how to construct decent societies or how to live politically or about what we might expect from ourselves as citizens or from our governing classes. So in my lecture a couple of weeks ago, I urged us to think about political literacy, and I defined this, as Ray said, as an attentiveness when considering these matters to the constitutive force of language and history. In particular, I wanted to reject a very common idea that language is a mere device and history is something to be somehow left behind. So when it came to the force of language, it wasn't so hard to think of examples. I spoke about uh, reconciliation and the enormous amount of suggestive work a word like this might do, the ideas and thoughts it might close off or bring prematurely to the surface. Or from the sphere of international relations, peace process with its suggestions of something alive, ongoing, peaceful, and somehow beyond politics. To be against the peace, peace process, for example, might carry with it the implication that one was against peace. I could also have spent a lot of time talking about the difficulties of critiquing or opposing, using a thoroughly financialized language, the financialization of life. If we don't like to think that money is the only thing that matters, might there not be something insidiously paradoxical about investing in people instead? I mentioned too the Australian official at Gallipoli who talked of the sacrifices the fallen had made for our lifestyles. I can't emphasize enough that this is not merely a matter of surface appearances or aesthetics. Lifestyles, or the use of the word lifestyles in this context betrays a whole way of thinking about the values that might inform our social and political world. The history of 20th century trauma, we might say, is a history in which language is the first thing to go. Now, as far as history is concerned, attentiveness to history, I felt, is, was important for political literacy too. Yet, we live in an age of compulsory 
commemoration, uh, Anzac, 9-11, and so on, and compulsive forgetting. The past no longer seems to be something we can learn from, but rather an ideological prop for nationhood, say, or a powerfully sentimental tool for closing off political debate. I remember in 2003 debating the Iraq war at a public meeting in Whitehall in London with a very, very confident neoconservative. The statue of Saddam Hussein had just been pulled down and this was perhaps not the best time to be arguing against the war. Nevertheless, I persisted and I warned of you know, inter-ethnic warfare and humanitarian crises and so on. After I'd finished, my interlocutor laughed and said, that's the trouble with people on the left, they're so pessimistic. Six months later, there was a general breakdown in the Iraqi state. At that point, I heard a journalist ask the foreign secretary about the legality of the war and the effects of the war on Iraq in general. He said something along these lines, this isn't the time to go backwards and wonder what might have been. We have a job now to do in Iraq. So moving on, moving forward, thinking of each day as a new day, this is the debased, ahistorical language of a certain sort of politics. There's a lot to be said about political illiteracy, and I tried to resist taking too many cheap shots. We, we might ask, though, why are things like this? Well, there might be one big answer, which I'll get to, but let me stick with a sphere of classical politics and offer four small, smaller answers, and these will restate some of the themes of my lecture. First, it might be that a debased form of, of economic literacy has overtaken all sorts of other ways of thinking through, say, human sympathy, historical knowledge, and political dignity. No one could have missed the fact, as I said, that in Australia in particular, politics has become the art of increasing material wealth. A second possibility is that political life has been captured by a technocratic elite or an expert class or career politicians who don't really believe in politics anymore. And I talked about Tony Blair and reading Tony Blair's um, autobiography and trying to, uh, looking forward to reading the, reading the passages where he described his passion for the Labour Party and discovering that these passages didn't exist in the, in the autobiography. A third possibility then is that politicians are somehow worse than they were, and I thought this was unlikely to be the case. I, in fact, I spent a lot of the lecture worrying about the, the lure and temptation of nostalgia. Um, after all, the past contains Roosevelt and Churchill, but it also contains Calvin Coolidge and Neville Chamberlain. A fourth and final possibility is that we're being persuaded to think of fewer, th fewer and fewer matters as political at all, and I gave some examples of this. Okay, that was the first set of questions then. Now let me turn to catastrophic politics. At the end of my lecture, I apologized for being so depressed about the prospects. But actually, it turned out that compared to Rob's lecture uh, the following week, my lecture was almost lighthearted and airy in its prognosis. Whereas I had been merely apocalyptic, uh, Rob's left everyone feeling completely devastated. And so I think this brings me to the second set of questions, and I, I raised some of these at the beginning of my lecture, or maybe it's one big question. Have these various questions about political literacy and political dignity been rendered somehow null or quixotic in the face of impending planetary doom? Can we even do politics in an age of catastrophe? I got the impression last week that writing, speaking, and arguing were passé as political forms, overtaken by the certainty of our collective fate. One continued to write, argue, and speak, but only as a matter of instinct or duty. But no longer in the world of Fox News and Gina Reinhart, because one believed that persuasion was possible or that political change through persuasion was sufficient, to outweigh the narrowing of our self-interest or the structure of media relations or the deformities of extreme offshore wealth or the repeated humiliations being inflicted on the very languages that we might use to call for change. But I differed from Rob in suggesting that there were three traumas afflicting our politics. In this sense, I came over as even more pessimistic.
It struck me that discussions of political dignity or, or literacy had to reckon with three catastrophes in the making. So the first was the immediate but just deferred, always just deferred uh, threat of economic collapse. The second uh, was the existence of 26,000 nuclear warheads in a never entirely stable international order. And the third was planetary overheating. And here I was more concerned with the second of two forms of denialism. The difference between denying the scientific evidence, which was, was Rob's um, paper, and being in denial somehow, a mental state, about the scientific evidence one nevertheless accepts as largely accurate. And this second form of denialism has produced what I call the politics of appeasement. And this term could be applied to the way we've responded to all three forms of crisis. Politics, as I said in my lecture, has become the art of hoping it won't happen. But as with aggression in the 30s, it's already happening. Perhaps the fiscal order is at the moment slowly collapsing, just as the proliferation of nuclear weapons continues, just as the planet warms. So just to conclude, just as, the, as inattentiveness is the danger when it comes to classical politics, I think depoliticization is the disorder we confront when it comes to catastrophic politics. When the decisive questions begin to look like or are treated as matters of fate or chance, the rest of politics is reduced to a concern with ephemera or procedure or personality. The stuff of ordinary politics just looks so small and incidental next to environmental catastrophe or economic vertigo. So finally, what is to be done? Um, I don't know. Uh, apparently, according to the philosopher John Gray at LSE, there is a form of apocalyptic Christianity that combines a belief that the world is about to imminently end with a belief in gradual progress. Of course, it makes sense to strive for a better politics here and now and regardless of the eventual outcome. Questions of justice and distribution were alive in the most appalling and hopeless of circumstances. The Warsaw Ghetto might be an example. So it would be an abdication to give up simply because of the inevitability of failure. Failing better might really be all that we can do while we wait for a miracle, either technological, cognitive, or political. Winston Churchill sailed across the Atlantic in 1941 at the height of the war, clutching a piece of paper on which he had sketched some ideas for post-war re reconstruction. This piece of paper contained the outlines of the Atlantic Charter, which was a blueprint for the UN Charter. But the prospects of peace, or even defeat of the Nazis, must have seemed remote, uh, maybe unlikely at that time. And yet the heroism of the gesture is impressive and moving. Theodore Adorno said that critical theory was like sending messages in bottles out into the future. Maybe this, for the time being, is the best we can do. Uh, I'm actually going to lighten the load, uh, having uh, driven uh, Ray and Gary to anti-politics or to catastrophic politics. I have to say about uh, those who were at my lecture last week will know what I believe. Um, I do think that we've um, come to a point where it's very hard to see the way out of a very catastrophic um, next 80, 100 years and beyond, um, even earlier than that. I, I actually think that um, it would be very good if more people in this audience and in the world um, read the books of the climate scientists who are trying to uh, explain what they understand in ways that lay people can understand. But um, if I can just say, because I feel, I feel that saying certain things um, is upsetting to, to people um, and that they don't want to hear. Um, uh, and I mentioned uh, my friend Clive Hamilton, who I think has written the most honest book about 
this issue. But some people, and I, I have to say some very, very significant people, think it's a great book, but many people find his book very um, upsetting and annoying, and I've heard from people I admire very negative comments about it. He's, one of the things that I mentioned briefly, I'll say it again, um, is that two, two of the climate scientists who do this work made a series of incredibly optimistic assumptions about the decline of emissions from China, from the United States, from other countries. And with assumptions that I can't now outline um, of an incredibly optimistic kind, they came by the end of the century uh, to 650 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, and those who follow what the climate scientists say realise that is an astonishingly dangerous level where the Greenland ice sheet melts and various other things happen and mass extinctions occur and so on and so forth. I do think we've reached a point, I don't think this has ever been true before uh, in, in history, we've reached a point where catastrophe genuinely confronts us and so um, even if it's an, uh, an unhelpful message um, I nevertheless intend to say it and I think we have to think about everything uh, uh, under the, the light of that. On the other hand, I do, I don't, you know, we, we clearly have to operate um, in, 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 in a way almost in parallel universes where on the one hand this thing happens and I don't think, I know I'll be going on thinking about it um, till I die, but I think people have to go on thinking about it. On the other hand, we have to live in a world a political world in which um, uh, very good things can be achieved uh, and ought to be achieved. So I want to take a much, uh, sort of take some of the pressure out of the, the discussion so far and some of the apocalypse out of it, or catastrophe out of it, and um, just ask a very simple question about the sort of what I take to be the driving force of this series of lectures, which is uh, our disillusionment with politics. And, and, I, if I, and that, so what I'll say now isn't catastrophic at all, but rather uh, may even seem mundane in, in the light of what Gary and, and, and I have said so far. Calling these lectures um, Whatever Happened to Politics, which Ray did, suggests two things. Um, one is that contemporaries are disillusioned by politics, or very many of them are, and that things were once different and better. Um, and I, I don't intend to interrogate those two points. I'm going to take them on trust. But I, it, there is something very strange about contemporary disillusionment, particularly in Australia. I mean, if you think about Australia, it more than most, certainly more than the States and, and most of Europe, um, we should feel fortunate. And indeed, in some ways, I think many people do. Uh, we're certainly uh, in this country and many others more prosperous than previous generations and societies not only have never have ever known but have even been able to imagine. Like Gary, one of my favourite authors is George Orwell and in one of his essays looking back on the Spanish War he says, look, if only, you know, if only peoples could reach the level uh, at which the British working class now have reached throughout the world, well, the British working class, when he's writing, compared to the working middle class of any Western society was immensely poor. Um, we are, particularly in Australia, but all throughout the Western world, our political legal forms are stable and peaceable, um, and in the minimal sense, that is, that governments are formed and removed as a result of elections uh, in that minimal form democratic, and that's very stable. Um, we should, I think, feel fortunate. Um, but I do think it is true, and I think that's what Ray called the lectures, whatever happened to politics, there's a lot of disillusionment, with, at least with the political process, if not with society. So all I want to do, because I wanted to have a frame for our discussion, and ma maybe link this a little bit with what others have said, uh, is provide just a list of the most common forms that I think of ordinary disillusionment with politics in this society. And I think it's, it's probably similar in other Western societies. Uh, the first of my list is that in contemporary politics, for some reason, we feel that leadership and the idea of governing has been replaced by the idea of management and, uh, through a bureaucracy. 
and in the light of which our idea of what it is to be a citizen has withered um, in a way that Ray talked about um, with citizen responsibilities uh, and rights being reduced to voting and perhaps to entitlements from the state and where the individual's relation to the state seems more to akin, as we often say, to that of a client or a customer than of a citizen. So I do think in the pores of these societies there is a feeling that citizen, citizenship is with it. I think that's one part of our disillusion. Um, I agree with Ray, although I, I'm not sure that the language he used would, would, would strike a chord with uh, many, m many people outside universities and so on, but I do think that people feel that those who enter politics do not do so, and he uses the word vocation, not sure they would use that word, but what they what I think many people feel is that many of those who now enter politics are not, do not really feel answerable to his, his idea of honour or do not feel answerable to the idea that, uh, that um, Gary talked about, which is to make the world a more just place, and that they now see what they're doing as cultivating a career uh, and making it successful in the normal way. And I think that is something in that more mundane way that I've put it that many people, is the source of many people's disillusion. I think, for example, I'll give examples so we're not talking abstractly. I think the fact that what looked like machine politicians and careerists took a prime minister down without any notice to the public or any reason being given either, even after it happened, when they took Rudd down, I think that has dealt a lethal blow to Labor from which it's not the only thing that's gone wrong, but it's one of the things that's gone wrong, and I think it's hard for Labor to return from that because I think that was the dramatic instance in this country of, of a feeling uh, that, that there's something dirty and machine-like about the cultivation of a career in a certain way. Something that I don't think has been mentioned in, the, in these lectures, um, except partially by me, um, but I think it's incredibly important in whatever happened to politics, and that is that we perceive uh, that the media takes a, a different role than it once did, that the media's presence has intruded into politics and shift, shifted the ground of politics in ways that we're still trying to understand, and that the media's presence in politics has been very harmful. Also in this country, as I bored people to tears saying, uh, we fear and we know that the media that matters in political terms is astonishingly concentrated. And if people haven't got a shock with the idea that a close ally of Lord Monckton, one of the most extreme and idiotic of the denialists, uh, is now abusing the board of Fairfax for not giving her uh, certain positions with regard to it just because they, they support a charter of independence and she thinks that they oughtn't. Uh, I, think, I think what's happening in the media in this country uh, particularly in newspapers in this country, and the sense we all have that the media is now playing a role in politics which it hasn't before, has uh, created very great anxiety and disillusion. Uh, something that, again, I think has got into our, the, the, the disillusion is um, that we know that politics is now, not, not only is there no plain speaking, and we call it spin. I, uh, my wife and I have been watching this wonderful Danish political program called Borgen, and, and, and the, the Danes have, have the word spin in their language as well. So that it's now such a part of politics that, that politics is largely the art of managing a perception. But I think we've gone so far in that direction that we now are shocked if someone speaks plainly. And we think, we've so internalised the idea of spin that we think, oh God, they've made a mistake. They've actually said what they thought. Um, it's one of the reasons I sort of admire Malcolm Turnbull because once he ceased to have realistic hopes of leadership, he began uh, more or less to say what he thought. But uh, I, th I think anyhow that the idea of the prominence of media and the idea of spin has disillusioned people and we know that something um, new has happened. I also think because of these facts, um, uh, more and more we are aware that the, 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 the simple uh, slogan is, out, is dominating over any form of argument. Uh, 
Um, and in a way, even intelligent politicians are now sloganizing and, and, and taking simple positions because in a way they'll not be, they know they won't be properly interrogated. If I can give my favor, I mean, obviously I'm thinking, oh, well, it's not obvious, but it's obvious to me, I'm thinking of someone like Tony Abbott, the asylum seeker question with a slogan, stop the boats. And with the technical position that the government's Malaysian solution can't be accepted because Malaysia, you can't send people back to Malaysia or to Malaysia because the Malaysian government hasn't signed the UN Convention on Refugees, while at the same time arguing that their policy is to tow boats back to Indonesia, which hasn't signed the UN Convention, but which will send people there, and that, they, that, that, that he knows that he can get away with that populism, and that no matter what argument might be put against it will be not taken seriously enough to do him harm. The feeling, in other words, of populism in the political culture, again, as I think, I think among citizens and those who attend to politics being deeply disillusioning and destabilising. I think we don't know quite how to handle that. The next thing I think that's been disillusioning is the uh, irresistible influence we understand of special interests, especially of corporations who can bend politicians and political outcomes to their will by manipulative advertising, by private lobbying, by threatening political retribution. Um, and we are also, I think, aware that where there's a clash between special interests and sound, sound arguments, it's the special interest that so often prevails. I think here, because I want to be concrete, of the effect it must have had on many citizens that a mining tax was destroyed and a prime minister partly destroyed uh, because of the threat of $100 million from the mining interest going into advertising. And in a way, we know that, no one, that governments can't withstand that sort of thing, or almost can't. And above all, and this is where I go back to what I was uh, depressingly said last week, um, we, we know that the combination of these things, populism, uh, the futility of argument in the face of special interests, the power of special interests, uh, the power of spin, and so on. Uh, we know all these things have got us to the point where I think many intelligent people think politics can't solve the things that most need to be solved. The questions that, are, that need to be solved, must be solved, can't be solved within the frame that politics has now delivered us. And I think, and, and Gary said there were three things, fiscal breakdown and uh, possibility of nuclear war, and, and the third one here is the one I spoke about, climate change. But nevertheless, there are some things now, and I think climate change is the overwhelmingly important one, where we know we need a new politics. I don't know why Ray says anti-politics, but we need a new politics. And we, at least I can't think of how it's going to happen. I can't think of the kinds of things that could be done um, that might make it possible for a galvanising of the seriousness of the society to do something, in my, the case that I'm obsessed by, do something as small as clean energy and getting rid of fossil fuels in a country where, for example, it's unthinkable even to discuss the future of coal if you want to have any future in politics. Uh, that, I think, is that's where I'd like us to begin to discuss. Well, thank you to our three speakers, uh, both for their longer presentations earlier and for their shorter presentations tonight engaging with one another. We'll now move to question and discussion period. We have people with microphones. Could I ask you please to introduce yourself when you receive the microphone? And could I ask you to keep the comments and uh, questions to a reasonable length? Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I come from the position of Richard Dawkins, basically, and Charles Darwin, and Copernicus, as opposed to the Roman Catholic Church, and so forth and so on. Now, my questions are based on my personal experience as a child psychiatrist of what's happening to planet Earth. Whatever happened to politics is an oxymoron from my point of view. What is happening to the human mind is more important in the era of digitalization 
and the symbolization of everything we do on two-dimensional screens, iPads, iPods, and so forth and so on, with wires in the earring in all our ears. Our society is being damaged. MRI scans and CAT scans show us that digitalization closes certain areas of our brain to feelings and passions in synchrony with our intellect. That's happening all over the planet. So I want to throw out a new definition of politics. Politics means matters of life and death and survival. And that's a very deep and profound problem. The Holocaust in Nazi Germany, Chamberlain <coughs> running around and saying peace in our time, so forth and so on. We all know about history. But today, where are the youth in this room? There are no youth here. Where are they? Where are the students? Just academia. And what Quite is academia? <laughs> so forth and so on. My question is simply this. Is it not a question of the digitalization of our societies that is doing the damage? In other words, the symbolization of everything we do. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to take that? Shall we take that as a comment? Mm, you. Thank you. I'll take that as a comment. And then, yes. Thank you so much. Appreciated that. I agree. I think I'm not agree with that. Uh, what happened by politics? What happened by mind, humanity of mankind? Because we see peace becoming war, freedom becomes slavery, justice come and justice, citizenship come to sheep. We are not sheep. We are citizenship. I think we need not new new politics. We need new law. We need freedom of people Australia from colony England and USA. These are problem. These are problem. The society come madness. A student comes slavery. Professor between professor and a student have a lot of gap between uh, poor people and rich people gap. We need to fix this. We need solution to this. I'm not agree what happened by politics. I agree what happened by mind humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Yes. Thanks to all of you. My name is Ryan Rosario. Uh, my probably pertains to something that Ray said about uh, lobbyists and special interest groups. Uh, is that probably one of the most, probably the biggest challenge? And with the, you know, like especially with two party type governments that are, uh, that are in most, in a lot of countries. If we, it, um, there's less of a diversity of interests as a result of, uh, of you know, just two lean parties, and therefore it's, it's the special interests and the, the two party system as the biggest uh, biggest challenges. Like in other countries where there are more than two parties, is it as politics have a better, you know, less challenges? Um, your challenge? No, I, I I don't I don't think the two party system is. Um, a great problem. Um, I think there are things to be said for the, it and things to be said for the European system. Uh, I think it's quite different from the question of special interests. I think, I think, you know, I think most thoughtful people now recognise that in politics uh, the question of money and its influence has to be tackled in some way or another. I think the, you know, I, I mean for me the, the, the example I used in little remarks I made about the capacity of the mining interest to shape taxation um, is the best little case in Australia. But in, in the United States, the situation is totally out of hand, where um, be, partly because of the Supreme Court's decision, which allows any amount of money to be spent by corporations at election time, Citizens United and all that, um, the, uh, you know, the, the capacity of corporations uh, both at election time and then lobbying between elections is now, in my view, makes the system almost dysfunctional. And, but, it, but I don't think the two-party system is, is a problem. I think, but somehow we have to come to terms with the fact that special interests can um, have a huge bearing on the outcome of elections. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for any democratic polity. Gary was just going to add something. Yeah, just a couple of um, disparate comments. I, I wanted to pick up what this gentleman at the front said. Um, there is something in that. Uh, I think one of the things we need to be a bit attentive to is the way that uh, 
languages become inverted in precisely that Orwellian sense that you, you mentioned where you know, freedom really does become servitude. And so a couple of examples would be the way in which governments talk quite a bit today about transparency while hiding as much as they can, and the way in which transparent inquiries often obscure more than they, they reveal, or, or again, at the, at the international level, the way that we really do go to war for peace. I mean, that, that, that Orwellian prophecy has now, has now come true. We, we, don't, we simply don't fight wars anymore. We, we go on peacekeeping missions, or we engage in peace enforcement, or we engage in humanitarian interventions, or what, what Carl Schmitt called pest control, but certainly not war. So I, I think there's something very, very profound about that. Um, but the other comment I was going to make was, was just in relation to this question of pessimism uh, and, and, and nostalgia, because one of, one of the points I made a couple of weeks ago is, is, is about the necessity for a certain degree of disillusionment in, in politics. And, and that might be the mark of a certain form of democratic politics, that when you've got very, very high levels of enthusiasm, almost obsessive levels of enthusiasm, you often have also forms of, of, of fascism and nationalism, which most of us would disparage. So, so there is something to be said in favor of disillusionment, but, but perhaps not at the levels we're experiencing today. Thank you. So this lady in the middle, and then... Hi, my name's Annette Brennan, and I'm kind of interested in to do with climate change. Why was it that someone like Al Gore had a special interest, didn't do anything whilst he was in politics? Um, I, I, I can't ans answer for what Al Gore did or didn't do. Um, I'm not close enough to the administration. Um, the fact is that, that um, during the period of when he was vice president, um, I think it was, there was a vote taken on the ratification of Kyoto and the Senate voted 96 to nil. Um, and what's he meant to do? Um, I mean, they, you know, I, I, those, I apologize to those who were at the, my lecture last week, but I did talk to someone who was an advisor to Gore, who was actually at Melbourne University, so I, I've, actually forgotten his name, but he spent some time there and I was lucky enough to talk to him and I asked would, would Gore have been as big a failure as Obama um, if he'd been president? And this um, person said, I don't th I'm not sure that he could have achieved more than Obama given the situation of the fossil fuel corporations and the, the, the situation of Republicans in the House of Reps in majority and so on, but he would have tried harder. Uh, I, do, I do think, I actually think there are two heroes, two Winston Churchills of our period, and one is Al Gore, uh, even if he didn't achieve more uh, when he was vice president. But he, after that, um, no person has had a bigger riveting, galvanizing effect on public opinion throughout the world on the issue. That's why his reputation had to be destroyed by, by those who you know, wanted to refute his message. The other, as I mentioned, is James Hansen, who's a climate scientist who's close to prison um, because he's out uh, on various issues uh, campaigning at the edge of the law. But I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to Gore to, to say why didn't he do more. The system in the United States has, it makes it almost impossible for someone like Obama or someone like Gore to get anywhere. And Obama's decided you know, to make, to, to to try and achieve other things and, 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 by, and using the Environmental Protection Agency to some extent to try and, you know, this absurd proposition that you can change the entire economy without discussing it, uh, climate change, but that's where he's got to. But I, I feel that it's a systemic problem more than a problem of individuals, no matter how heroic, I don't think they could have got much further. Thank you. Over here and then down. Uh, yeah. My name is Jim Ive. I was thinking <coughs> all the time about uh, Vaclav Havel's essay, Politics and Conscience, which he wrote in 1981. Um, 1981 must have been a time when to be a dissident in Czechoslovakia was uh, a pretty grim place to be. 
and the future must have looked pretty bleak. Uh, yet that essay is one where he talks about politics and conscience and the politics of uh, personal integrity, if you like. Uh, and he talks about uh, what he calls anti-political politics. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about the importance of that and the importance of that personal integrity being maintained that someone like Havel was able to do and then achieve much later on. Uh, linked with that uh, phrase of times of crisis are times of opportunity. Uh, in that uh, as we enter periods of crisis, as we're certainly doing, times of crisis are also those times when ideas which were unthinkable but can become thinkable and actions which were perhaps so marginal become something that people start to turn to. And this suggests <clears throat> to me that the importance of the little things, of doing the little things, of maintaining the ideas, of maintaining the critique, of maintaining the discussion, not necessarily at a level where everybody's going to understand it and, and accept it tomorrow and the Murdoch press will suddenly turn around and buy it, but that because times of crisis are times of opportunity, it becomes more important than ever that those kinds of discussions, ideas, experiments about what an alternative society might be like are undertaken and are nurtured and those things are happening. So that to me is where <clears throat> there's more of a hope for a future of politics in the Havel sense of politics. I'd be interested in any comments on that. Thank you. Ray, do you want to? Um, well, uh, I, I, I think uh, I'd, I'd answer in two ways um, uh, to what you said, um, in ways that reflect the distinction I drew between um, uh, sometimes not knowing what we believe or what we should believe uh, uh, and sometimes not uh, losing a grip on the concepts that form the content of our beliefs because if you take something like integrity, for example, integrity in politics, even in the Havelian sense of politics, uh, it still has to be framed within a political discourse which itself is made up of concepts that one's reasonably confident, confident in. Otherwise, one doesn't know what kind of integrity it is. Political integrity is in some ways different from moral integrity. Or at any rate, m morality and politics don't always coincide, and not because politics abandons morality, but it has its own distinctive values. Uh, so, when, so, if, so, for example, when I said about the intervention, uh, that the spirit in which uh, that was carried out was an insult to the dignity of the indigenous peoples as human beings. I meant that to be, I, that was a moral offence. But I also wanted to say it was a dignity against their citizenship, uh, sorry, an attack against the dig dignity of their citizenship. And I think that's a, a, an offence different from a moral offence. And so, I, I, so, so what I wanted to say really is, is in, in a way, is that our sense of what's possible in politics is going to depend upon the concepts that we've got a reasonably firm grip on. That's really, really, really wanted, I wanted to say. And for, all, for very, very complex reasons, I think some of the constitutive concepts of politics, and citizenship is one of them, is slipping from our grasp. For all. Uh, I'll, I'll, can I say something quickly? Yes, yes, please. Um, just on Havel, um, he's one of my favourite political authors. Um, um, but I think we have to remember that Havel was writing about a very specific society which he called post-totalitarianism and which he thought was vulnerable because it was a world of appearances where the glue was ideology, where everyone was pretending uh, to believe things that no one really believed in. And thus individuals, this was his great insight, in that situation individuals acting, living in truth was his way of describing it, or standing up with backbones would act as a sort of uh, a bacteriological weapon, he said. Everyone would see that it was possible to live like a human being and not like, not ser in a servile way. And this would spread a contagion which would under undermine authority. So their integrity was a very politi politically clear and brilliant lucid understanding that no one else had living under Soviet-style dictatorships. But unfortunately, a lot of translation has to go on before it can work in societies where individual actions are so easily 
kind of absorbed. Um, and integrity was not by itself enough in the Havel analysis. It was integrity in a situation of a, a kind of ocean of mend mendacity and, and pretense and so on. So that's where I've often wondered how you can apply Havel in a situation of our kind of mm. consumer democracy. But well, I was just going to say something about my favourite target, Tony Blair, in, in relation to integrity and, and conviction. Because yeah, I mean, here's a good example of the way that, 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 that virtues, like the virtue of integrity and the virtue of having convictions, can, can have the sort of reverse effect. For him, for him I, got, I got the impression that integrity meant some sort of very, very minimum personal honesty, and, and that beyond that, all bets were off. The most important thing was acquiring power and holding on to it. And as far as conviction was concerned, I mean, we had the rise of the, 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 the conviction politician. And conviction seems like a good thing to have in politics, but um, it really ended up being a right to do the wrong thing over and over and over again, and to say that one was at least following one's convictions, which seemed to be the argument used, for example, um, uh, uh, during, the, during the Iraq war. And it was very striking, as I said a couple of weeks ago, reading Blair's autobiography, the, the, the one politician he really admired most who had character and conviction was, was Margaret Thatcher, a politician who wasn't, of course, a member of his own, his own party, though he's been described as a Thatcherite. I did want to say something about crisis, though. I, do, I worry a bit about crisis. I'm not sure what, if, what the effects of, and I know this was, the, was one glimmer of hope in Rob's uh, lecture a couple of weeks ago, the, the idea that perhaps uh, some catastrophe or crisis might produce a, a new form of politics does seem quite quite alluring at, at one level, but but uh, but I wonder if it would just set off a a fresh round of of of, of oppressive security politics as as 9/11 did. It seems much more likely that that would be the case. Uh, we didn't really see a fresh politics, for example, after the the, the, the disaster in New Orleans. Um, my name's Fergus Ryan. Um, do we really need a new politics, or is the old politics fine, and the left just need to do it better? They need to sort of brush up on their tactics. And I say that thinking about um, when you compare uh, the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street and the general Occupy movement, the Tea Party went out and protested, but they didn't stop there. They, they continued on in the, with the normal political channels and had their people that they liked elected into Congress and took Congress um, back. Whereas Occupy said, oh no, we're disillusioned with politics and we, we need a new politics. And that meant that their candidates didn't get into Congress and it means that they, they, they don't have as much clout. Um, as the as the Tea Party people, so I wonder what your comment on that is. Um, well, there is a sort of left in this country, um, which is the Greens, um, and they, you know, they 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 are in conventional politics. Um, but I think the the forces against them will keep them as a minority and the most they're in probably the optimal situation they'll be for the next 15 years having um, the balance of power in the Senate with a favourable government in the lower house. Um, I just think that the, uh, the galvanising that's needed for people to see that radical things have to be done, not even radical things, I mean now it is implausible for any political party to say we need to increase in a serious way taxation if, for example, something as simple as treating mental illness with the seriousness it needs, with the resources it needs, or the disability insurance which might get through, but the amount of money that would be needed to look after people with disability so that, as any decent society should, even something as minor as an increase, a party saying we'll increase in tax would doom them. And in, in, in my view, it's partly the ideology of the time, neoliberalism, but it's partly also the, the 
Murdoch Press and other parts of the media would, would absolutely hammer the Labor Party if it said it was going to increase the GST by five, cent, uh, five cents or increase income tax in a serious way. So, I, I, you know, you say the left should do things, but, uh, you know, how? I don't know. I honestly, I, I've come to the point where I don't know how you can break out of the balance that we now have in this kind of society. I mean, how, how is it in, in a place as wealthy as this that if families that have the misfortune to have mental illness are struggling, are really struggling, and the state won't support in a, in, a, in, a, in a country which is so well off as this one? And it, the answer is, has to be a technical answer that no one is willing to say we, have, we need serious increase in taxation and greater equality. That uh, so, I mean, again, I, I'm being depressing, but I can't see how, I, I, I've been thinking about these things for 40, 50 years in different ways. I can't see how you break a certain hold unless there is a sort of a galvanizing uh, crisis where, where something is, is recognized, which consciousness is shaken. Um, but I, do, I don't have hopes of the left being, uh, being able to sort of get its act together somehow, in the way you put it. I wish I did, you know. This, th that, that sounds like the sort of question I would have asked if I'd been in the audience. Uh, um, I mean, I, I think there's something in that. I, I, I'm always struck by the gap between the compassion that one sees all around one when, when you see people you meet people on the street or you talk to them at, at parties and so on, and the cruelty of our politics. So it, it seems to me that something is, is, is required that would close, close that gap. And, the, and the, the, those old left virtues of, of redistribution, compassion and justice might still have a role in a contemporary politics because they certainly still seem to have a role in, in, in social life at the, at the micro political level. So I, I'm, I'm puzzled at why politicians don't feel as if they can make those arguments. I mean, there may be all sorts of structural reasons, which we've spoken about a fair bit in this, in this, um, in this lecture series. I would just say one thing about the Tea Party, though. I sometimes think we overestimate how well the right does in, in galvanizing its base, or how disillusioned its cultural base becomes at its lack of success. I mean, the, 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 the right in the United States has lost many, many cultural battles that it thought it would win when it placed people in power. So there's a fair bit of disillusionment, which may have, of course, led to the creation of the Tea Party itself. But it's not a series of simple victories for the right in its, in its ability to mobilize public opinion in certain directions. Uh, I, I know. I, I, well, I feel both, both. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I sort of agree with Rob, but, the, but there's, but, and I, I've spoken about this, some, I may have even have spoken about this in one of these public lecture series, and it's something that Rob and I disagree about, and maybe he's right because he knows politics much better than I do, but, it, but, I, but I, I was really struck once when I was uh, living in the country, uh, staying there writing, writing a book and talking to people at the time, uh, just just after the Tampa uh, crisis, and um, and uh, and I remember I, I remember these conversations so well because the, at, uh, I, you know, the, I say well I I think there will be a different policy. They say oh no no you can't have a good jumpers, and uh, you, you, people have got to come in an orderly way. And then then I say well let's just focus on one one thing. Is it right to keep children? behind razor wire, as we are at, we're at the time doing. And then what, what I found really interesting, they'd sort of not look at me and they metaphorically sometimes literally move from one foot to the other and then say, oh, we can't have cue jumpers, we can't have this, we've got to protect our boards. And I say, no, let's just focus on this one thing about the children. And then eventually they say, no, we can't have a policy like that. And then I say, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, here's another question. Should the policy, even as it is, be as cruel, uh, uh, should it be, be as cruel as it is to adults in detention centres? Let's agree it's always a complex business and who can come and immigration policy, etc. But let's just focus on that thing. And again, the same thing. Moving from one foot to the other, literally or metaphorically, oh, you've got to have border protection, you've got to... So on. 
And then, after pressing, they said, no, it shouldn't be so cool. And, and I ju I, that made me wonder uh, whether, if, if at the time was Beasley, had trusted people enough and had, had prepared the ground for long enough, instead of just assuming that it, what, what robs me on this is that Beasley had to choose between political defeat and political disaster on, on, on that matter. Uh, but but I, I, I'm not convinced that had Beasley been prepared to have taken up the case long before and made arguments of that kind, surely it doesn't have to be so cruel, whatever the difficulties, and which, is, which is, in a way, now at Gary's point, of maybe in that way, the compassion that we often see in all sorts of places, but don't, but don't find it in our politics, maybe that was the kind of bridge that could have been made by, by just trusting that compassion more than at that stage the Labour Party was prepared to do. Um, it's going to ask this gentleman in one minute, uh, but I, we've had overwhelmingly male questioners ask our overwhelmingly male panel questions, so after this gentleman asks his question, if there are any women in the audience who've been waiting to ask a question, it might be your time. Um, in a, a globalised context of overwhelming uh, disillusion about the corporatisation of politics and the uh, monopolisation of, of media ownership, etc., um, perhaps the one glimmer of hope could be gleaned uh, after Copenhagen, where a number of the, uh, the city mayors from all around the world uh, made a commitment that they would go back to their cities and try to, um, try to organise at a grassroots level in spite of um, the highly distantiated um, uh, global um, players. Well, I, I think that's a very good thing, although I, I have to say I, I think the only answer to it is actions of international community and nation states. But Thank you. Um, my name's Jane Lewis. Um, I share all of the despair of the panel about the, uh, um, about the future of the world and the planet. But I have been reading a fascinating book that just in relation to the, the comment that you were just making, Ray, about the, this is written by a moral psychologist called Jonathan Haidt, um, a rather ironic name, really. But he, he tries, it's not spelled that way, but he tries to distinguish between the motivators behind the assumptions that sit behind a left and right view of politics and the values, we've talked about different, we've been talking about different values, so that the, he identifies through a great deal of quite impressive research that, that care and fairness are the values that are most important, the, the assumptions that sit behind a great deal of our leftist thinking. Whereas other, other important and culturally, culturally widespread values such as loyalty and authority and sanctity are more important to the right. And so though, yes, we can force people to accept that compassion is, um, is something important for us to consider, in fact, we are dividing the psychology and driving people a little bit further apart because we are not, we're not using any arguments about loyalty, about authority, and about sanctity. So, I mean, his, his thesis end is, I haven't finished the book yet, but it's about changing our discourse so that we are using broader values to, uh, to, rather than just saying, well, can't you see compassion is important, to say, here are the ways in which I can see that authority is really important here. Here, here I, can see, I can see where loyalty is very important, of course, and this is where the queue jumping and, and all of, so, so many objections come from.
unless we can start to see, to stand in other people's shoes rather than just thinking them over there, like the corporations and the Gina Reinhardts and everyone that we consider the enemy, and unless we can somehow stand in their, in their shoes and see things from their value point of view, we just risk creating a bigger and bigger divide. And I'm sorry, I don't know if that's a comment or whether, whether it invites some comment, which would be delightful. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I do think the question of climate change is, is not, ought not to be, it's mad that it has become a left-right question. And it didn't used to be even. Mm. And it's nothing to do with loyalty or nothing to do with compassion. It's to, it, if it's anything, it's the, one of the deepest of conservative instincts, which is the, the, the present generation being the, the steward or the custodian of the earth to be handed on, um, having taken things from the previous generation and to pass them to the future. It should be, I mean, if, if it wasn't a topsy-turvy world, it should neither be a left-right issue, it's just sort of crazy that a matter of just believing what scientists in their overwhelming majority tell us and thinking in terms of the conservation of the world we've been given to be passed on to the future. That isn't a left-wing thought at all. In some ways, it's closer to a classic conservative position, which I have a lot of sympathy for. Um, so, what I haven't read Haidt's book, and I will eventually read it because it seems to be buzzing around. Um, it doesn't seem to me to help in this issue particularly. And, um, you know, I don't think it's a lack of sort of stepping, me putting myself in the shoes of Gina Reinhardt or um, the fossil fuel corporations in the States. I think it's, it's, there's just a structural problem of the defence of certain interests. Um, putting in peril uh, the earth. And I don't know what, you know, I have no idea what you can do about it within our frame. Uh, well, I, it, it needn't just be conservatism versus the left. After the, well, there were left-wing conservatives like um, Hannah Arendt, for, for, for example, uh, who wrote wonderfully on the nature of authority. Uh, and um, uh, for, for a long time during the Howard years, I was trying, uh, trying to argue for, to reclaim a genuine sense of love of country from the jingoism that was being espoused, uh, which I take to be a degradation of the love of country. And I couldn't see why on earth it was that the right lay claim to the love of country. And then, with the, then added to that at the same time, uh, to go back to, to my earlier theme, added to that a very jingoistic conception of an education in, in, in citizenship. Uh, so I, I, I did feel that the left should reclaim those things from, from what, what, what uh, was then, then the right. And uh, it, it, uh, I think that it... One thing I'm absolutely sure that, that Rob is right about is that we, we are headed to some terrible catastrophes. How, in, and we are then going to have to rethink some things. And uh, we, we, uh, it, it, I, I certainly think in, in, in the case of, let's say, refugees, and there, there'll, I'm sure there'll be more and more of them as climate change starts to, to, starts to develop and, and, and the, the climate crisis develops and there'll be so many people fleeing uh, areas. That, that we, we then have we, we then have to, re, re, to rethink what it is to we now have the idea of a host country but that's not not quite right and at, at, in one way or another we have to base a politics on 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 rethinking the consequences of the fact that people like us just through sheer luck enjoy the, the benefits and the, the fruits of the earth in an unparalleled way. Rob was talking about this. I said so too in my, my lecture, in the first lecture, how it, that we must be probably the luckiest people ever on the face of the earth in, in, in many ways. And other people suffer the miseries of the land only because of the bad luck of being born in, in this particular country or, or, or other. And so there has to be a thinking, rethinking here of what we call the, the, the right to keep... <laughs> John Howard said, we have the right 
I don't know if righteous is, is, is the right word to, 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 to think here. It's much more like acknowledging on the one hand the needs of people who, who, who suffer those miseries, our need to be rooted, not only our need, but in, in, in a country that's not then undermined by massive increases of people who care not at all for what's loved in the place. And that would be reclaiming love of country from the rise to, to start formulating something that looked like a decent policy under which we, 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 we accepted people. And it doesn't have to be a left. A lot of these things aren't left-right right issues, it seems to me. I'm going to take the privilege of the chair and ask the last question of each of our panellists. Uh, and I want to ask about optimism. Uh, and I'm not doing that sort of simply in a let's have a happy ending to the story way, but in part because of some of the challenges that Ray set out in his first lecture uh, and some of the problems of disillusionment that we might have. So I want to ask each member of the panel, what about, if anything, about modern politics makes you optimistic? What, what has got better in the last 10 years? <laughs> Ray. <laughs> Oh, I think so many things are better. I mean, um, we, 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 we do, I mean, the, the relative decency of, 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 of our politics is extraordinary compared to how it has been in the past. Uh, so um, the, the opportunities that people have, the, the, the better way people are treated, and, and, and by, by, I, this, I think it's an, in that respect where it was sort of unparalleled. Uh, we, we, for the most part, we don't, we, we don't suffer great humiliations. Uh, there's a, a, an Israeli philosopher who says that perhaps it's just as important as the question of what is a just society. Uh, he asked, uh, the question is what a decent society is, and he said a decent society was one in which people didn't, weren't humiliated, mm. uh, which is a really deep and important thought. And some people who, who might have known of a, a man, because uh, I read about him in After Romulus, a man called Hora, he, he said to me with such pleasure about the pension, he had the pension, and he said, you know, it means so much that one isn't humiliated after one has retired, the one, even though it was a modest pension. This, this, is, this is an incredible uh, uh, thing to be grateful for. Gary. Well, I, I spoke la uh, two weeks ago about the achievements of a, a period between 1945 and around 1975 um, in Western, what were then called welfare democracies. And the fact that successive governments haven't quite managed to dismantle, for example, National Health Service in England or or tertiary education uh, in, 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 in the UK and Australia, um, or the sorts of access to social justice that we still see inherited from that period strikes me as a, as a good thing, though we have to defend these, these gains pretty resolutely. Um, I suppose just to combine your question and this question over here, I mean, I think there is some hope in, in, in using the idea of nation and, and patriotism in some way. I, I think if we're going to solve the problem of, of planetary warming, we have to think about it in an intergenerational way. And, and I think the best way to think intergenerationally is to think through the nation. This is a point that Malcolm Bull made in the London Review of Books just a, a few weeks ago, that we're, we're more likely to have a sense of human sympathy for people within our own state who will live in 50 or 100 years than we are for people elsewhere. So, so in some ways, I, I think a, a feeling of patriotism revolving around the nation state might, might in an ironic sense, be part of our salvation. Thank you. Um, I mean, when I was at this university um, in the 60s, some things were beginning to happen. Uh, the two of the most obvious things, which are the most astonishing improvement in my view in the world, one is that the moment in which uh, people in Western societies thought of white people as superior uh, to people with coloured skins has more or less entirely now passed. It seems to me a profound revolution in sensibility for the good. Um, 
not entirely successful but very largely successful, even or equal to that, uh, is uh, feminism and the, um, the genuine movement towards female equality, which is, is centuries, millennia old um, holding down of women. Uh, it seems to me, and, I, and I agree with Gary that the, the period after the Second World War in Europe, perhaps because of the, the, the memory of the Depression and then the threat of communism, led to the extension of the welfare state, a, a, a sort of Keynesian social democracy, which I think created some of the most successful uh, societies where freedom and equality were kind of, pra in a practical way, um, balanced. So when my pessimism is not based on my sense that the, not the most astonishing achievements have happened in the last 50 to 70 years within Western societies. I think some of the greatest things that have happened in human history have happened in that period. Trouble is that an accident occurred, and there are many problems, but I'll be dramatic. An accident occurred that the energy for the kinds of societies we built was fossil fuels that have been under the earth for hundreds of millions of years. And it turned out that the, f the physicists of the 19th century who knew that doing this had the threat of heating the earth weren't yet taken seriously. And it wasn't wickedness or materialism or consumerism. It was the accident that fossil fuels were an extremely good energy source to build the kinds of prosperous societies we have the pleasure of living within. But it turns out, in my view, to have been the um, the most fateful accident. Um, it turns out, if the scientists are not wrong, that this has seriously imperiled these great societies. I'm, I'm not a pessimist about Western societies. It never have been. Um, I think, and I think the last 70 years have had greatest achievements. My, my worry is that, that we don't now have the um, wisdom or the courage or the um, imagination to see that something very big has to happen and very quickly. Well, building on that, let me conclude this series with uh, just an observation about what I think was one of the most uh, exceptional moments, to me certainly one of the most moving moments of our politics in recent times, which was in some ways not political at all, and in some ways in the, the feminist sense of the personal being political was, was enormously important. Uh, and that was indeed on Q&A uh, when Penny Wong was questioned about gay marriage. Uh, and at all sorts of levels, this was a woman who was in charge of a major ministry in the, in the hard area of the money, something that couldn't have happened very recently. This was a woman of Asian background, also something that couldn't have happened in my lifetime, early, early on, in my, even in my lifetime. Uh, and a, a woman who was in a lesbian relationship with children, talking about this very openly on television, again, something that was difficult to imagine even a very short time ago, uh, but now passed relatively unremarked. And with enormous sincerity and integrity, and quite quietly, simply said, I know what my family is worth. And in many ways, that seemed to be what many of the people here were mourning that there had been less of in our politics real personal integrity, a personal integrity that then reflected with sincerity and had political consequences. People being able to be prepared to speak the truth honestly, simply, and to some degree courageously. Uh, and the way in which that was accepted and respected by the Australian community uh, did seem to me to indicate that, as well as all the things, the very serious and important points that have been made today, about the problems and the concerns we might have about the future. There was also some reason to hope that things have got better and perhaps if I can give a happily ever after ending, uh, may still, we may find imaginative, creative and human ways of trying to ensure that it does continue to get better in the future. Thank you for your time over the last month and congratulations to Raymond Gator and all of our speakers on a wonderful lecture series.